from the Moscone Center in San Francisco. This is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010. Now, inside the queue. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. <clears throat> this is Dave Vellante. We're back live with SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld. Believe it or not, it's day four. It just flew by, folks, didn't it? And uh, my name is Dave Vellante, and I'm your host this morning from wikibon.org. And uh, we've got a great program again today. We're going to start this off with a, with a customer panel. And today joining us, we have Jack Rahner, down th all the way down to, to my left, who's the VP of IT at Alpha Staff. Hello, Jack. Great to have you here. And uh, to uh, Jack's right is, is Jason Somer, who is the president of Atheon Systems. So thanks very much for joining us. And to my left is Jason uh, Glau, who is a senior storage architect at Compellent. So gentlemen, thanks very much for taking time out of your schedule to join us this morning. So Jack, I wonder if we could start for you, so uh, with you please. So um, tell us a little bit about Alpha Staff. Why don't you start there and, and uh, a little bit about your role. Sure. Uh, Alpha Staff is one of the leading payroll companies in the U.S., so we're the fourth largest. Uh, we cut and manufacture payroll checks as our bread and butter, but uh, you know everything from benefits to 401k, taxes, workman's comp, that type of thing. Uh, I'm Vice President of Technology for Alpha Staff. So, so as a VP of Technology, what's your role there? Um, somewhere around technology. Yeah, so <laughs> you, you run the whole shop or you uh, touch no, the storage? Uh, or? My, uh, my uh, role is more around the infrastructure, so the storage, uh, everything from help desk to storage to networking. All right, so Jason, tell us a little bit about um, Atheon Systems. Sure, Atheon Systems is a company I founded about 10 years ago. Uh, we're a systems integrator and outsource provider uh, for firms here in San Francisco, primarily uh, financial firms like hedge funds, et cetera. Uh, my role as president is uh, one of uh, consulting and infrastructure design and uh, you know, we've, we've built an IT team and small firms buy into that as their solution for IT support internally. And we're kind of in a unique position in the sense that we're also a reseller of Compellent. So we kind of see it from both perspectives of, of selling it and also using it with our client base. And uh, you were telling me before we went on that you were uh, actually pretty hands-on and, 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 and technical, m more, probably more technical than most people with the title of president. <laughs> Well, I, I like, you know, we, I keep my company small so that we can provide a really high level of service and a very close relationship with my customers. And so, not only that, I just really like the technical aspects. So, as much as I enjoy running a company and managing people, I like to stay very much in touch with the technology and I think that's very valuable to my customers. Great. So, and Jason Glau, we had uh, Phil Soren on yesterday, so we, we know what, uh, what Compellent does. And uh, how long have you been with Compellent? I've been with Compellent now for a little over three years, um, and prior to that, I was a two-time customer. So, I uh, oh really actually been involved with Compellent for going on seven years now. Were, were you were a customer, uh, uh, saying uh, two other firms? Two other firms in uh, San Diego County. So it was uh, uh, Kyocera, uh, Kyocera America. Uh, they're a large global company, um, and then following that, I was uh, hired by Viejas Casino, uh, Indian Casino in uh, California to uh, design and build a new data center. So. So you you. We're an early compellent customer, is that right? Or yeah, you just jumping jobs like I, uh, six months? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, one of the early adopters, yeah, one of the first systems in San Diego. Ah, cool. So, uh, uh, Jason S., I wonder if you could uh, give us your perspectives of uh, VMworld. How was the show for you? Um, you know, I, I thought the exhibitors were really interesting. I, I, was, I had a couple of, of things that I was looking for, um, in particular, uh, ways to accelerate VDI. Uh, improved management tools for VMware and, and that sort of thing. So that was very interesting. How about you, Jack? I'm, I'm sorry we have to make you reach over to that mic, but uh, what'd you see that was uh, of interest to you? How was the show for you? Well, the show, first of all, it was an, you guys had amazing weather here. San Francisco is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so a great place to have a show. Uh, you know, it's amazing, as you said, day four is, is it's here. Um, it's okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, it, it, I think we had some record turnout compared to last year, which was the record turnout from the year before. Uh, and it's obviously uh, this whole virtualization thing might actually work, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had Todd Nielsen on. He told us that the, the number was uh, 17,000, which is uh, pretty incredible. Yeah. I, you know, incredible. It's, it's, it, I think it's one of the best shows of the year, if not the best. You know, a lot of 
diversity and really interesting. I, I would think from a customer standpoint, you get a really good perspective uh, across the ecosystem as opposed to, you know, a lot of shows, it's just sort of one really vendor centric. You, you, know, you find that here? You know, everything is, you know, of course, dealing with vir virtualization VMware. But as you said, it's it's every manufacturer has a, has a foothold in VMware now. Every single co you know partner has something to do with VMware. And it's a central focus. Uh, I was trying to explain to our tax cab driver what VMware was. I was like, where do I start? Yeah, yeah. All right, here's what's not. It's not Hyper-V. But besides <laughs> that. <laughs> so, Jack, t tell us a little bit more about your operation. I mean, you know, roughly you know, the, the, the size, you know, servers, virtual servers, terabytes, things like that. Just paint a picture for our audience. Yeah, a quick picture is, uh, you know, we're a pretty small company. We started out uh, with two refurb Dell servers seven years ago. Uh, the company's around 12 years old, but now we have, you know, roughly 200 virtualized servers, uh, mostly on component. Uh, and, uh, you know, like most people with them, when you get to uh, tiered architecture and virtualization, it start, you know, it's pretty easy to get to 100 servers overnight. So, uh, and how many physical servers? Wow, I have no idea. I wish I, I, wish I was more technical, but I have to imagine, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty lean. We're typically at a seven to one ratio. Yeah, okay. All right, and, and I'm sorry, how much storage did you say you had? Did, did uh, I think we lost count somewhere around 500 terabytes. Okay, oh, decent size for a Yeah, small, small company, company. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the virtualization has really allowed us to increase the quality of our product. And by that, I mean, you know, we have dev environments everywhere now, QA staging, and uh, being able to quickly roll and provision uh, uh, hosts by uh, Compellent or by, you know, in addition with VMware, allows us to do those at quality level. Can you, do you know how much of your application portfolio is, is virtualized? Yeah, roughly? we are uh, roughly about 99% virtualized. And, really? and uh, you know, everything that can be virtualized, we've done. It's only things that require certain car smart cards or otherwise that can't be virtualized. So, so yeah, configuration nuances are the only things that yes, right, that hold right. you so, back uh, from the, you know, So far, we found there's really no reason if not to virtualize if you can. Okay. Now, Jason Somer, you're coming at this from a, a little wider perspective, both as a consumer of storage and, and, and systems particularly compellent storage, and also uh, uh, an integrator and seller of those. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, to be a reseller of compellent was an easy decision. We started off as a customer, basically, representing one of my uh, customers, Passport Capital Hedge Fund, that at the time needed a very high-performance SAN. We had already made a commitment to VMware and needed virtualized storage to go along with virtualized servers. And so, uh, you know, Compellent was impressive enough that uh, I'm not a reseller. Uh, uh, it's not a really core focus of my business in, in a broad sense, but I decided to, you know, partner with Compellent because uh, just very impressed with the product. I think they, you know, Compellent leads in pretty much every, every category. And in particular, they're strong in areas that are really important to us. Uh, particularly in finance. You know, I was saying to, I've been in and out of the, the storage business for a while now as an analyst and an and executive and, and did some other things. I was saying to Phil Soren yesterday that when I first heard about Compellent, I think they called me up and said, hey, let's do a briefing. And, I, and they were describing the architecture, the automated storage, team, all this stuff that I used to associate back, you know, back in the day with mainframes. And I was just shocked. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when I saw a picture of it, I said, this, this can't be. And of course, so compelling, and of course, some others are real pioneers in the industry, and you guys are sort of at the forefront of adopting those technologies. And what has that meant to your business? Yeah, well, you're you're correct. There is it. It's kind of come full circle where you're, where we're coming back to some concepts that were prevalent in mainframe, right? But for all the right reasons. I mean, if you take a look at computing in the last 20 years. Uh, you know, client server began as kind of an alternative to mainframe computing. It, it empowered organizations to do a lot more with with their server infrastructure, and and but now coming to virtualization, it's kind of the best of both worlds, where you can take uh, advantage of, you can really take control of your computing environment and do what you want with it, right? But also benefit from storage tiering and things. I think. Uh, to you know, in specifically compellent, the data progression feature is really important for us. Um, it, it works quite well, and it means that we're not uh, wasting expensive disks at fast spindle speeds on data that doesn't need to be there. And that's uh, you know a, an important factor in in you know designing our environment and making sure that we're spending money where it needs to be spent. Um, and so compellent really leads there. 
And so one of the things in, in Wikibon that we've talked about a lot, and my colleague David Floyer has written about a lot, and we've been following this virtualization for a number of years, and one of the things he said early on was, if you're going to virtualize your servers, you better think about the storage as well. And, and in fact, most customers at the time were not virtualizing the back-end storage, um, unless they were buying you know, companies like Compellent. Yeah. Um, so we know that virtualization really taxes storage. Some people say it breaks storage. Uh, so so uh, Jason Cloud, tell us a little bit about why that is and uh, maybe how you guys are sort of addressing that problem, both from the standpoint of you know, traditional uh, VMware implementations and also VDI. Let's talk a little bit about right. VDI. Yeah, I, I think the challenge with uh, virtualized storage environments is that uh, they, they need to be able to scale. Right, so we were talking about how development environments, QA environments, just spring up out of nowhere once you have this flexibility to build new virtual machines and provision new storage instantly. So you have this, this server sprawl situation. It's contained within a virtualized environment, but there's still sprawl nevertheless. So designing an infrastructure that can endlessly grow and scale to give you that endless uh, performance and capacity capability is real important. So in terms of breaking storage, Absolutely, the traditional storage model is, is a set defined pool of resources, right? The new storage model is a pool of resources that can endlessly expand as you grow, right? So I think um, uh, with loads like VDI, you start to, to tread into this very unpredictable world, right? Whereas your server environments, your SQL servers, your mail servers, they're all very predictable. We know what those loads are gonna be on a day-to-day -day basis, but uh, no one can predict what an end user is gonna do. Right, with a VDI session, uh, using sharing your backend storage, again, you've got to make sure that not only you can scale, but you can isolate unpredictable workloads at the same time. Meaning if, if one user is going to suck up <coughs> a bunch of whatever it is, I.O. or capacity, you've got to make sure it doesn't domino affect the rest of the user base. Right. right? Individual users have been known to do that. Right. So, okay. So are you guys using v a VDI, Jack? Why don't we start with you? No? Okay. So... How about you, Jason? Do you, you and your customers? I mean, yeah, what are you seeing? we're looking into it, implementing it where we can. It, for us, it, it comes into play from, from a disaster recovery and business continuity standpoint. Uh, we need a way to be able to allow traders and portfolio managers, et cetera, to be able to, to uh, you know, access trading systems, order management systems remotely in the event of a, of a disaster recovery or business continuity situation. Uh, I think VD, VDI honestly has a little bit of ways to go in terms of being able to, to provide a a day-to-day -day de desktop uh, solution for really high-end users. And so I'm, I'm speaking of traders and, 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 and you know, uh, I think there's other industries as well where, uh, like software development, et cetera, where, where it still has a little bit of ways to go. But um, it's a very important piece, and, and we're looking at ways to, uh, you know, uh, make the best of it, and you know you definitely need a, a high performance virtual storage in order to maximize the potential and so yeah, you know my my personal take I wonder if you guys could comment on this is that, that VDI just isn 't a great fit today as it stands for a lot of especially small and mid sized organizations I mean, people don 't want to give up their their beefy laptops and you know there's, there's issues around you know, graphics and the economics thus far haven't been that great, um, unless it's a very specific use case, like a call center or maybe a claims desk or things like that. Do you guys, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. That, that's why I think it's evolving. I think it, it's, it's getting better, and, and, but you're exactly right. We've identified a particular use that's, that works for us. It, it, I think it's indispensable with respect to DR. And so we're still looking um, to see the industry evolve a little bit where we're hoping to see products come out that will allow us to synchronize virtual desktops to physical traditional desktops um, to help with mobility and business continuity. Yeah, it's definitely becoming more common now. We're seeing a, a lot of uh, larger enterprise and even in the, the high end of the mid-range space, we're seeing more VDI. Um, you know, Compellent being involved at the very low end all the way up to the very large enterprise, uh, we get to see the entire spectrum uh, and I think that uh, uh, VDI, obviously, the, the, the ROI is there when you've got uh, a larger number of clients, right? Larger number of client desktops that can be virtualized, centralized. Um, but then there's still that, that issue of control. So you'll, I don't think the, the politics of VDI will ever, ever go away. It'll just be a, a new and better way to handle it. Um, when I first purchased it, it wasn't an option for me, especially at Kyocera. We had AutoCAD developers where 3D graphics and the the intensive uh, CPU resources on their desktops were, were uh, a big part of our business. 
right? So I think even now today, that's still a challenge, but uh, com many companies are getting there. I'm sensing a real change from the, the, the messaging that we're hearing from VMware around the desktop in general. In fact, it's almost like they're avoiding the term desktop and starting to use the term end user and, and make the user the, the, the focal point you know, of that innovation where you've got iPhones and Blackberries and iPads and, mm -hmm. and, and of course desktops and laptops and, and to maybe give data access to all those devices and a consistent experience seems to be where their messaging is, is headed. And my sense is that you know, this management team, we had Todd Nielsen on earlier this week, we had Richard uh, McAniff who runs development for VMware, another other, a number of other executives. They seem very passionate and they all, the other th common thread, Rod Johnson from SpringSource, they really seem to want to disrupt you know, the current state of the industry. It's like, and IT is you know, broken in many ways, right? And they, they're, I think, out to fix it for a variety of reasons, help customers and, and obviously make a profit and grow a company. Um, and it seems to me that, that that next wave of end user access is really where they're trying to focus now. And that might be the tipping point for that whole desktop virtualization space. You guys have any comments on that or disagree with that, agree with that? What do you think? You know, I think uh, as we as we were talking earlier that um, you know it, we've been trying to do the thin client. We've been trying to do um, you know Citrix uh, with thin clients and uh, get this whole ROI for v for a virtual desktop for some time now. And I think and for a while it did fit only certain applications, such as you were mentioning call centers, or you couldn't use it because you were doing AutoCAD. But now I think it fits more into the you know, common space to where the, you know, it's 80% now, it's 80% of everything, and it's only 20% that it's not working for quite yet. I mean, with the advent of the PC over IP, some, uh, some of these great new uh, thin clients you're seeing uh, with the, you know, use of the protocol, the accelerators they have, the built-in monitors now. Um, I think, you know, we use it for, well, you know, I said we didn't use it, but we use it for DR, but, uh, and that's a great, great use case. But now you're seeing it more and more, and I think, you know, obviously Vue and obviously some of the hardware changes and the protocol changes uh, have been obvious in this exhibition. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I agree, agree with that. It's, that's going to make VDI better. In fact, we had some customers on that were saying that with Windows 7, you know, 90 plus percent of the functionality of a laptop or a desktop is there, very high, you know, 99 percent, and they're, they're, they seem to be very happy. I still think, my, my sense is that Microsoft is going to be able to play very strongly in that game. They'll play pricing games, they'll, they'll put out new products, etc. VMware, in my view, has got to change the game in order to have a, a major impact, or, or otherwise it'll be more of a niche, as is Citrix right now. And so that's sort of what I'm looking for and what we've been talking about in Silicon Angle and the, in the Wikibon community. But, you know, it's fun to pontificate about this stuff. <laughs> Let's, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I, th I think we're going to see a hybrid environment for a long time, right? Uh, as a mobile user, I'm an architect. I meet with customers all day long. I've got to have <clears throat> my 100% of my compute resources with me all the time and, and mobile, unconnected. Um, but then I have a virtual machine back in Eden Prairie, Minnesota at headquarters that I log into for for various tasks that I'd like to be able to do at the corporate headquarters, right? right. So um, I'll, I'll pull up that desktop when I need it, shut it down when I don't. So I, I think you're gonna see that uh, across the board. Just folks are gonna want their, their private place, right? And, and we've seen it with the phones too, right? Even on my, on my mobile device now, I can connect to that virtual machine. So like you're saying, we're gonna find there's that end user experience. You're gonna want that, that common experience wherever you are. But then again, I, th I think you're still gonna need that that uh, resource that's that's disconnected. Yeah, I say it's it's fun to, to riff on these things and pontificate. You guys, if, if you ever want to be an analyst or a reporter, <laughs> you, you get bored with what you're doing. Let me know. Can you write? <laughs> Do you like to write? So, let's talk about integrated data management. Uh, uh, Jason, what does integrated data management mean to Compellent? What what are we talking about when we talk about integrated data management? All right. So uh, we're we're talking about managing the data rather than just just storing it. Right. A lot of systems where. Uh, you're just given a place to, to to dump your data, and then and then nothing intelligent happens behind the scenes, right? So, uh, integrated data management is about understanding how you're using the data, making appropriate decisions, making cost-effective decisions, right? Maybe even uh, uh, not not essentially uh, making the decision for you, but alerting you that a that a potential for savings is there, right? Um, I think the 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 reporting suite. That, uh, that virtualization uh, solutions uh, provide today gives customers that, that uh, wealth of information to make good decisions around what they do with their data. Um, you'd be surprised at how many times we meet with customers that, you know, uh, that have a false impression of their actual workloads. 
Uh, they get the data on the system. They realize 95% of that data moved down to SATA drives. And, and you know, during the design phase, we might have been aggressive with a 70-30 split sort of a suggestion to the customer. And when we find out over 95% moves down, um, that's usually a surprise to folks that didn't realize that so little of their data was, was really busy each day. So it's really all about uh, more intelligently understanding how the data is being used. If a human ever attempted this, uh, we'd fail miserably, right? Uh, only a, a block controller that, that understands how blocks are being used could achieve that right. you know, successfully. So, uh, Jack and the other Jason, so for years we've just sort of stovepiped our infrastructure. Right? I mean, that's uh, the way in which people manage it, whether it's files and, and block or, you know, or, or even high end and low end. Um, do you feel a need to unify those? Um, or are you comfortable sort of leaving things separate and managing them separately? What's your philosophy on that, uh, Jason? Hmm. Or your customers' philosophies? Maybe you can share the, what you're seeing in your base. Well, uh, you mean with respect to reporting? No, specifically taking, say, a, 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 bl a block infrastructure, like uh, a, you know, traditional block infrastructure, or and separating that from a file-based, NAS-based, you know, architecture. Do you want right. to keep those separate, f and 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 why, or do your customers and you want to bring them together, and, and or why? I mean, I think it ranges, but personally, I like to see things integrated. Um, I think, you know, I like to see, y you can go out and kind of uh, procure various parts of your infrastructure and just buy best of breed in certain particular, you know, areas, but from a storage standpoint, I like to see it pretty tightly integrated. It's just easy to manage. Um, and then if, you know, certain types of data might make sense on NAS and you might want to move it to SAN, it's much easier to do it if it's all within, you know, an, in an inclusive product set rather than on disparate products. That sort of thing. Yeah, so as long as it's predictable. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. It doesn't I mean, have to be the very best, highest end performance as long as it's consistent. Sometimes you do. Sometimes yeah. you do, and certain applications need absolute, you know, performance. Would and, you and isolate those types of applications? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And virtualization okay. allows that, right? Yeah. That's one of the greatest benefits of virtualization is you can identify applications that need to have resources focused very, very sharply on them and do it. Right. And you're not you're not limited, Jack. Is this an issue for an organization of your size? You, you know, um, as you said, we used, everything used to be separate, right? And virtualization does allow you to have tighter control over those separate entities. On the other hand, it's all about making your data easier now, too. Uh, you know, I'm I'm fairly evangelical around Compellent, uh, and uh, I always say I made two mistakes with Compellent. Uh, one is they try to talk me out of buying less 15k SaaS. Disk, you know, you don't need this. Your, your satas are going to work for you. You know, our algorithm does work, and we're like, no, no, no. Let me just go ahead and make sure I got enough spindles and enough speed. So my first mistake was buying too many drives. I really didn't need them. Now, now that was a mistake, but they were right. My second mistake was not listening to the first first mistake, right? Uh, uh, but you know, their, their fluid data, their fluid data progression really works well. Uh, and I would say, you know, for 99% of my my data, whether it's my ERP system or file data. This compellent does what it's supposed to do without my interaction with it. So combining all those resources, having and I, can, I happen to use SSDs as well. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah and, okay. and so by having that smaller, it's a much smaller tier as far as capacity. But by having that uh, that option for extremely low latency, extremely high IOPS, and allowing the algorithm to do its work effectively, uh, I I feel comfortable now in migrating everything to compellent, migrating everything to basically the same SAN. I have all the IOPS and latency issues kind of resolved at the moment. So Jack, do you envision, and maybe you're, you're moving in this direction already, sort of two tiers, so tier zero, SSD, flash, and then a bit bucket, you know, tier three SATA. You know, it, it's all about cost, right? If everything was uh, if everything was the same price, we'd all do SSDs, right? And so that's that's the whole point for tiered storage. Uh, it, it's cost per per megabyte or per gigabyte or per terabyte, right? Right now, uh, and uh, you know, so I see if we're still going to stay on the three tiers, but of course, as the price of SSD is go going down, everybody's been waiting for this for years. Uh, for us, it has been a lifesaver uh, moving to SSD. Uh, I think we have one of the use cases to where you know we don't have extremely high IOPS, but we have extremely high latency due to some of our legacy file applications and ERP applications. And so we were having some you know, pretty critical performance issues in some areas where SSD was the answer at even a high price point. 
That's yeah. been a consistent theme that I've heard uh, from a lot of customers this week and, and elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to see uh, a consistent trend of more SSD use. We're going to see the two-tiered systems move to three-tiered as they adopt SSD. Uh, we saw a sharp rise this year uh, just with the, the lower cost of SSD, and I think that trend's going to continue. So as the, the cost of these resources comes down, we'll see more customers deploying uh, and realizing the benefits, right? Like you said, Jack, lower latency is one of the key reasons, but there's a small minority of data that really needs that highest performance, lowest latency. Um, but I think you're going to see the three-tiered architecture because uh, there's still going to be a, a majority of that data that would reside on those 15K spindles. We'd call that the tier two uh, today, right? So I think what we'll find is uh, as the cost goes down, tier two may start to disappear, but uh, over the next year or two, I think we'll still see a more of a three, three tiered architecture. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jason Sommer, you mentioned um, reporting. Actually, my colleague David Floyer is in the audience, and uh, he's done a lot of analysis on um, various systems and subsystems, working with like PG&E. We have this uh, service where we provide um, energy consulting. We're working with PG&E, and we have to look at the reporting of the vendors to actually see what the utilization is and other factors so we can calculate how much energy is actually being saved when you move to these types of systems. So right. he, he's assessed that a, a lot. I mean, David, who, who's, who's, we're a couple of the vendors who, got the, who have the best reporting. Just shout it out, I'll repeat it. They have the best reporting, yeah. Yes. Now, Capellant, was, was, would, you, would you put them at the top? Are they the best, <laughs> in your opinion? Really the best, the single best. Number one in your view. Now, you haven't eva evaluated everybody, right? Is that? Almost all of them. All right. Yeah. So okay. So that's that's a that's an expert's opinion, independent opinion. And um, I mention that because he has often said to me, he's shocked that more vendors don't do a better job with reporting because it helps their customers and it helps the customers to justify the expenditures. Yeah. It's like Yeah, I agree. I mean, a, a lot of competing products tack on reporting like an afterthought and it, it very much feels that way and it's less than useful. I mean, compellence reporting is excellent. At my fingertips, I have everything I need to analyze you know, how my storage is allocated. You know, and to kind of also continue the point of data progression, you know, we're in a situation where virtualization is still kind of coming out of its infancy and best practices are still evolving. There's consensus is building on how to best do this. One of the things that can happen very easily as, as you're architecting a virtualization environment is you can misallocate data. Well, with Compellent, you might, we might take a look at a particular database and say that might reside best on 15K RPM SAS drives, but uh, perhaps in, in, uh, in practice, uh, that much of that data is better suited for SSD or something else. Well, we don't have to be exactly accurate the first time we provision it. We can let data progression analyze it automatically, move it around, and optimize it. And so reporting goes hand in hand with that, where we can right. see where our data is going and, and then make more better informed decision. As, and, and as we get used to the system and everybody's data is different. I mean, as Jack was pointing out, he has really you know particular requirements. Um, every industry is different, every business is different. Um, Compellent is so flexible that uh, you can make mistakes in provisioning, get it get it wrong the first time, but the stakes aren't so high. It's not a big deal. Yeah, I see. You know. a great point. Is yeah. you know, you're not freaking out if you didn't get it right. You're exactly. Not optimizing on right. day one because eventually you'll get there. Yeah. And quickly. The system will learn. Yeah. Uh, within day, days, weeks, months, whatever it is. Usually days. Yeah. Okay. Or or less even right. sometimes. So and and Whereas then you had to do that manually. Forget it. I right. Mean, you have an army of people trying to tune the thing. Yeah, on any other on mode. any other SAN, that could be actually really difficult to have to move the data elsewhere or provision it differently. Uh, you know, and compelling. It's actually, you know, and we were the biggest skeptics. I mean, we're very careful about selecting our technology, and we took a look at some of the, you know, like data progression and and some of the more um, cutting edge features of compelling, and we're like, nah, you know, this 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 won't work. Right. They, but then we set it up and actually it works really well. And, and, you know, during migrations and P2V migrations and moving from traditional, you know, physical server to virtual, um, we've had our issues. But when the smoke cleared, 
you know, it wasn't compellent. Compellent stood alone as the one piece of the architecture that, through it all, had been totally stable and had performed as advertised. Yeah, and that's why compellent's doing so well. So you know, the stock price is up. You see three pars going crazy. And that's, the reason is that IT today is is really driving towards simplicity, right? All right. Jack, you had a you comment know, there? Uh, we had talked about this at dinner the other night, was that um, there's a lot of products you see out there, uh, you know, VMware, Hyper-V, everything, that do what they say they're going to do for the most part, but there's, there's always a smoke problems, there's always a few problems. And I can think of two products that I use, uh, Riverbed, actually being one, and Compellent, who actually, you're, we're amazed, we're like, they actually do exactly what they say, <laughs> and, and, and much exceed, and high exceed, uh, exceeds our expectations. I think it's a Minnesota thing. You know, <laughs> I really do. Yeah, you know, it's not. You know, let's let's set expectations, you know, realistically, and try to over deliver, right? Not try to hype it too much. All right. So, uh, my last question. Um, uh, let me start with Jack. So, so what's on Compellent's to do list? What do you want to see them do to make your life easier? Hmm. You know, that's a difficult question. You know, obviously I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, but uh, the, you know, to make my life easier, it's already being, ha it's already happening. I mean, we we uh, looked at all all the other uh, storage vendors out there. We did extensive testing with Compellent. They over delivered on what they promised already. Uh, I see new technologies that coming in the future, such as maybe you know, uh, QoS on traffic, uh, you know, traffic shaping over the uh, over the network from the SAN. Uh, but uh, you know they're delivered on the ROI right away. I'm able to reduce headcount or change my headcount from having full-time SAN administrators to now using those highly skilled people to have, you know do more projects at the same time. Uh, so you know at, at the moment uh, they're definitely the f leaders in the technology. I think they're shaping where it goes. So Jason, any anything you'd add to that? I would just kind of confirm what Jack said in terms of ease of administration. Uh, from a business standpoint, you know, I need system. I'm looking for systems that are simple and elegant. I mean, get the job done, and they can be quite complex under the hood, but I want an interface that's simple and concise and intuitive, at least from the standpoint of a sysad, right? Yeah. So I, I, I don't want to have to use my senior uh, systems administrative cycles on just day-to-day -day maintenance. I, I want them working on projects and designing infrastructure. And you know, the, the interface and management of Compellent is such that I can, I can have intermediate level people, uh, you know, provisioning LUNs and things like that. If I, it doesn't require such a high level of expertise to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. That's really important. Right. Okay, folks, we have to wrap. But uh, Jack Ronner. Jason Somer, Jason Glaub, really appreciate you guys coming on, sharing your perspectives with uh, the SiliconANGLE community. Uh, this is Sil SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld Live. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on today. All right, thanks for having us. Thank really you. appreciate it. And um, we will be back with uh, John Furrier and myself talking a little bit about um, what we saw this week and maybe some predictions. Be right back.